Hello and welcome to another episode of the Kate Hildenbrand podcast. Today we're going to try and answer a very controversial question. Is it okay to eat fish? And the answer is not as clear cut as I'd like it to be. So let's get into this mess. While everyone seems to be talking about the climate crisis these days, most people seem to think that they alone can't make a difference or that it's too late to do anything about it. And with the 1.5 degree target getting closer and closer, while policymakers and the capitalist world just prioritize profit over the environment, it really can feel like there's nothing left to do. We are currently on track for 2.9 to 3.4 degrees of warming instead of the target 1.5, even after things like the Paris Agreement came into play. So where would we start to reduce emissions? As about a third of anthropogenic, so human-made, greenhouse gas emissions come from our food systems, starting there sounds like a good idea. Remember that lovely Ray Hilburn person I mentioned in my episode on pick and choosing your facts? He's a renowned pro-fishery scientist, and he and a few of his colleagues suggest seafood as a low-carbon protein source. During a passionate speech at the Pacific Island Fishery Group and Hawaii Fishermen's Association for Conservation and Tradition, God, what a name, he argued that eating fish is what's best for the planet. And he painted a very convincing picture by bashing his farmer son and comparing an idealized, absolutely not realistic view of fisheries to the worst of agriculture. Picking and choosing his facts, in short. You might have heard me rant about that speech in that recent episode. He really pissed and pisses me off. I just don't like that person at all. Yeah, anyway, on the other side of that debate is a movie called Seaspiracy. Hillborn calls it vegan propaganda, and after watching it, I can't really blame him for calling it that. Anyway, the dude who made that documentary? I don't know, drama seems more fitting. The dude who made that documentary claims that the oceans are going to be empty by 2048. Even if by empty he means empty of fish, that's a tall claim to make. So let's have a look at what's actually happening to our oceans. First, let's settle the debate if our oceans are actually being overfished. Currently, industrial fishing covers 54% of the ocean surface, so four times the area of agriculture on land. There's a really cool project called SkyTruth, and they use satellite images in AIS, a system that's built into ships to broadcast the position originally designed to prevent collisions, to give us information like this. They also use the system to figure out where bilge dumping is happening and to spot illegal fishing. More on bilge dumping another time. Overfishing isn't a new trend. Since the early 1800s, we fished quite a few population to the brink of extinction. We're nothing but efficient when it comes to exploiting nature. We've talked about that. If you think we've learned our lesson, let me burst that particular bubble. Thanks to harmful subsidies that go to commercial fishing fleets that are still ongoing and have even increased in recent years despite things like the common fisheries policy in Europe, small local fisheries are being supplanted by larger commercial operations. There's this 2018 paper I read, and it said that 54% of high seas fisheries wouldn't even be profitable without these subsidies, making them ecologically destructive and economically absolutely unprofitable. They just don't make sense. And it gets worse from there. The rest of their profit usually comes from exploiting labor and underreporting catch numbers. So yeah, let me say that again. More than half of high sea fisheries only make a profit by using your tax dollars, exploiting labor, and just lying on their catch numbers. Yeah, that's cool. And it's not just that we're killing the top predators. When we run out of the top predators, we go for the next level down. This practice of fishing down creates a chain reaction of unbalance in the ecosystem. So yeah, that's not good. And not even taking into account issues like the fishing methods, like bottom trawling, causing immense destruction to ecosystems and bycatch. So catching things you weren't intending to catch. So you're usually just throwing them back. I know dolphins are a little bit of a cliche here, but dolphins actually are a common bycatch. 
Fishing methods and bycatch will get their own episode at some point because between bottom trawling and bomb fishing and dolphins getting caught in nets, there's just so much fun to be had there. So in the meantime, let's return to that claim from Seaspiracy that our oceans will be empty by 2048. Does that mean all fish stock will eventually collapse? Well, the paper he cited is from 2006 and created quite the uproar. Almost everyone seems to agree that we're exploiting our oceans and overfishing is happening, but the exact degree is a little bit up for debate. So 2048 seems a little overkill and even the original authors have now distanced themselves from the claims. They instead want you to look at the bigger picture of the paper and how awful we are to our oceans. But yeah, people still quote that paper without checking their sources. Isn't there enough drama in all this without us over-dramatizing things? As long I can't even blame people for not believing environmentalists or making fun of us if people like that Seaspiracy dude keep over-dramatizing the facts that are already pretty dramatic if you just go with the truth. <sighs> But no matter if that original paper was right or wrong, if the expiration date of our fish stock is 2048 or 2248, or if they would not collapse at all, things have looked up quite a bit over the last 15 years since that paper was published. I don't know if it's 15 years, something like that. Don't ask me to do math. A group of researchers last year created a detailed plan on how to rebuild marine life. If and only if we can release large pressures like climate change, it would be possible to restore abundant structure and function of marine life substantially by 2050. That's a pretty big if though. But it is possible, that's one thing to keep in mind, it's not too late, we can make a change. Okay, let's return to the present. Today about a third of fish stocks are being overfished. Some areas like the Black Sea and Mediterranean Sea look even worse than that with 62.5% of the fish stocks being overexploited. And if we look at individual species like the Pacific bluefin tuna, they have plummeted 90% from their historic levels. So while we might not be overexploiting all fish stock, I mean two thirds are not being overexploited, that's a good thing, right? We're doing a pretty good job at exploiting our oceans. And I think the fact that we're still giving out harmful subsidies to large scale high seas fishing operations that wouldn't even be profitable without subsidies, exploiting labor and faking catch data, that should not be ignored. I think it's highly unlikely that we'll collapse all fish stock at some point in the future. Because the lower levels usually benefit when their predators are no longer there to eat them. But we need to keep in mind things like chain reactions of ecosystem instability, the additional pressures of rising sea temperatures, ocean acidification, pollution, and that practice of fishing down going for smaller and smaller fish. If we can't find tuna anymore, will we go for the next level down and the next and the next until all of them are gone? There's a lot of uncertainty here, so there isn't really an answer yet. I hope we never find out. At this point in the debate, people like to bring up surplus production. So let's talk about that for a second. Fish population growth isn't linear or exponential. It follows the bell curve, that statistics student's nightmare. It means that in the beginning, when there's a few fish and the numbers increase, that growth is exponential and it goes to a peak, after which population growth slows down again. If you eat that fish, you can keep it at that maximum rate. Even if you don't fish at all, population growth won't go beyond that maximum peak. Because after that, things like there's just no room, um, eating the larvae, pests and such take over. So the idea of surplus protection is to eat what would not increase the growth at all. In other words, the growth is density dependent. It depends on how dense the population in an area is. In theory, if we eat only what's above that line, we would not be harming the population. Sounds good in theory, right? Well, the problem is that there is a lot of variation in fish stock. 
One year they grow faster, another year they grow slower. And some of that is already taken into account mathematically when these photos are calculated. But things like periodic weather events, quasi-periodic weather events, so El Niño, La Niña, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, things like that, can push things beyond what's already calculated in. A study of achovies and sardines found that yes, they are density dependent, but most of it comes from environmental factors. And then there's rising sea temperatures, acidification, pollution, eutrophication, and all those other issues that can influence the growth of a fish population. What's sustainable one year might not be sustainable the next year. But in theory, if we could keep consumption to only the surplus, we would not be harming the stock. Oh, of course, that doesn't take things like underreporting and exploiting loopholes into account that push the catch beyond sustainable levels everywhere except on paper, or ghost nuts, the immense plastic pollution caused by fisheries. There's a lot, and all of those will become topics in another episode. One thing worth mentioning in this context is that we're already creating an evolutionary shift. To quote National Geographic, unlike natural predators that cull the sick and weak and unfit, human fishermen price the biggest catches and throw the smallest ones back in. And that's not just preference, but often regulation. You might have heard before that fish below a certain age, well, length, as an indicator of age, cannot be sold. So now it's good for the fish to stay small for longer because growing big increases the likelihood of being caught. In other words, we're shifting evolution to smaller and smaller sizes of fish. And that leads us to a big question. Is it even possible to fish sustainably? In my opinion, the answer is probably. Local small-scale fisheries led by locals that have more than mere profit in mind can be done sustainably. Commercial fishing and sustainability are not polar opposites. Most local small-scale fisheries are not the problem. Sure, there's things like bomb fishing that are done by individuals, but that's a topic for another day. In general, it's not the small-scale fisheries causing the issues. But even bomb fishing aside, small-scale fisheries are not perfect. They still struggle with things like bycatch and add to the supply of ghost nets and lines for marine life to get tangled in. They aren't perfect, but they are usually not why we have this problem. The ones that cause the big problems are the large commercial operations, the large fishing fleets that go further and further out into the ocean or enter areas that were previously fished by local small-scale fisheries. Those areas are not their backyard, so why would they give a fuck about them being exploited? They then exploit the ecosystems, the fish stocks, and even the local fishermen. And that's where the harmful subsidies come into play again. We're still subsidizing these operations. The small-scale local fisheries have a harder and harder time making a living until most of them eventually give up. But they still have to feed their families, so then they get exploited for labor by the harmful commercial fishing fleets. Let me not get into how South Africa, the southern part of the continent, not the country, Southern Africa, I guess, had su became such a huge place with piracy. That's a story for another day again, but fishing comes into play. Okay, back to sustainable fishing, or rather the idea of sustainable fishing. Ray Hilburn, that pro-fisheries scientist dude, believes that fish are a great source of protein and that eating fish is the answer to the climate crisis. There is a lot wrong with his logic, but his definition of sustainable fisheries kinda makes sense, kinda. If we believe him, sustainable fishery is fishery that has long-term constant yield, preserves intergenerational equity, and maintains biological, social, and economic systems. Let's take that apart. Let's start with long-term constant yield. So the idea that makes fishery sustainable for him is that fishers don't lose out on their catch, that we can keep taking the same amount of fish from the stock over and over and over again. That's a very commercial point of view, but technically nothing wrong with that. The problem again is the aforementioned variation. Another issue is that it takes fish stock in isolation and ignores that they are part of ecosystems and that 
fishing methods like bottom trawling are really, really destroying ecosystems, even if we ignore ecosystem instability because we messed with it. So just the mere practice of fishing is destroying ecosystems. Because if you just drag very heavy nets across the bottom, everything that lives on the bottom kind of doesn't stand a chance. It's the underwater equivalent of clear-cutting forests, but sure, let's look at constant yield. To be fair, there are two more points on his list. Intergenerational equity and maintaining social, biological, and economic systems. Both of those are great concepts in theory, but they feel more like mockery now. Let's start with the maintaining systems thing. To be able to get to a point worth maintaining, we would first need to restore biodiversity and abundance. How would we even do that with the effects of bottom trawling, bomb fishing and other really harmful practices that we have done? It just feels like mockery to talk about maintaining something when we've done so much destruction that it will take a lot of effort to return our systems to a place worth maintaining. And then as to not fucking it up for the next generation, well, we're the first generation to really feel the effects of climate change and we're supposed to be the last to be able to stop this cascade of shit from rolling. And yet we're sitting in our houses with fire all around us claiming that everything is fine. All these issues are just made worse, yes, I'm sorry, it can get worse, by the unreliability of seafood labels. Labels like the MSC label are just not reliable because of corruption, falsified data, and the for-profit organization MSC. So MSC gets paid to put that label on boxes. Why would they be objective if overlooking issues gives them more money? So these labels essentially just create a false sense of doing the right thing for consumers while lining the pockets of organizations like the MSC. And finally, an often overlooked point is the role that fish play in carbon sequestration. So when fish eat plankton and all that, they store carbon in their bodies and also facilitate moving that carbon to the bottom of the ocean with the Poo Express. I had an entire seminar, it was a three-day seminar last year, that was all about this topic and it was super interesting and not fishing or overexploited fishing would make a real dent in our greenhouse gas emissions. When I tell people all this, they usually ask me why the policies in place aren't working. Don't, don't we have politics to ensure that catch stays below sustainable levels? Shouldn't there be fisheries management to take care of all this? Yes, in theory, fisheries management should keep catch below sustainable levels. A great example of how well this works, unfortunately, is the common fisheries policy in Europe. It was supposed to end overfishing by 2015 in most cases, but at the very latest by 2020. But even the aims of the signatory countries were often below the required targets. The IFW Kiel wrote an entire paper about why the common fisheries was a failure and why they think it was designed to fail. Political decision-making instead of clear-cut rules that allow short-term interests to trump long-term aims and a lack of consistent enforcement were two of their very valid points. And the only punishment or consequence for the countries that didn't meet the goals is that we'll just try again for the next 10 years. This has failed, so sure, let's change the quotas around a bit and try again. While many countries have implemented policies that are trying to prevent overfishing and return catch to sustainable levels, it's often too little too late and lobbies and the commercial wants of everyone just prioritize profit over the health of our planet. In addition, bias in the assessment of fisheries is commonplace and catch numbers are often falsified or loopholes exploited. We'll get more into the falsifying and the loopholes another time. Even where fishery management exists and is done properly, it relies on the information from scientists. So even if fisheries managers are doing everything right, the information they get is often not what they should be getting. 
Just look at articles that are casting fishery in a positive light. Almost all of them are from Hilborn and his colleagues. And Hilborn himself was a great example of how reliable fishery scientists sometimes are. He has taken a lot of money from the seafood industry, which he only reported after Greenpeace called him out on it. It's very hard to stay objective if you're getting paid by one side of the debate. But even when the data provided is accurate, it often is. A lot of fishery scientists are good people doing good jobs. The information is usually drowned out by the lobbies either sowing doubt or misinformation. As long as politics are in play, personal profit is often over truth. The lobbies work very hard to maintain the status quo because that's what's making the money and maintaining the status quo is easier than getting change. As long as politics are in play, personal profit is often louder than science. We saw that with the climate change disaster where lobbies just started sowing doubt and doubt is all you need. We saw it with the cigarette industry lobbies that just made you doubt the harmful effects of cigarettes, something that seems unbelievable now, but it was done and some people still fight for cigarettes not being harmful. And we're seeing it now with overfishing. The seafood industry is doing a great job. Lobbies are loud, while scientists are often quietly doing a decent job. So, is it ethical to eat fish? That's the big question. Final note on aquaculture, because that's usually where people say, but then we should just eat fish from aquaculture. Aquaculture has some upsides, but it tends to introduce more issues than it solves. One problem is that pests and illnesses are created in the dense populations inside aquaculture and then from there spread to the wide populations. Another problem is that you need food for those fish and that's usually smaller fish that have to come from somewhere. We'll talk more about aquaculture in our episode on fishing methods. For now, let's answer the stupid question, is it okay to eat fish? As you can tell from what I've said, large scale commercial fleets should not be supported. If your fish comes from local, small scale fisheries and you're sure there was no exploitation of the environment, exploitation of labor, falsified catch numbers and any of these issues, by all means, eat your fish. Another example of fish that would be okay to eat would be invasive species. If you don't add plastic to the ocean or burn massive amounts of fossil fuel to catch it, there is absolutely no reason not to eat invasive fish. It can even be beneficial to the ecosystem to take the invasive species out. An example of that is the lionfish. It's a pretty, pretty, pretty fish and is really good at catching prey, has venomous spikes, and the fact that it's so pretty made it interest to the aquarium hobbyists. The problem is that the aquarium hobbyists at some point are thought to have released some into the wild, which is why it's now an invasive species in the Caribbean Sea. So outside Florida and in the Caribbean islands and such, there is so many lionfish and they don't get eaten by anything. And they also don't get detected as predators by their prey. So smaller fish just swim up in front of them and get swooped up and eaten. So if you want to eat fish, eating an invasive species such as lionfish, it's even supposed to taste good, would be a good way to go about it. If you don't have lionfish or other invasive species around, what's your answer? A good start would be to stop taking seafood for granted. Cheap seafood comes at a cost, even if the cost is not yours. And while we can't rely on labels like the MSC to tell us consumers what's sustainable and what's not sustainable, saying no to seafood might be the answer. Every big change in history has started with a few people. Don't think you can't make a difference. While you not eating seafood might not save our oceans, speaking up, educating others and leading by example can make a difference and lead to change. So don't think you don't matter. Your actions and your voice actually do matter. While there is a lot more to talk about and I'm itching to get into some of these topics, I think that's a good place to leave it for today. Next week, we'll continue our climb along the tree of life and talk about octopuses, finally, yay! If you've liked the episode and want to support me, make sure to rate, like, comment, subscribe and all that fun stuff. 
A special thank you to all of you who have supported me in the past with your donations, especially Robert and Paul who support me every month over on Patreon. You guys rock! If you too want to donate, buy me a coffee or sign up to Patreon or find out how you can support me without money, head over to katehildenbrand.com support. Until next week, weirdly yours, Kate Hildenbrand. <laughs>